Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. For the past two decades, North Korea has repeatedly caused international concern with its development and testing of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. But while the political aspects of these programs receive plenty of media attention, it is difficult to gain a realistic picture of the technologies at work, their effectiveness, and the actual stockpiles in North Korea. To learn more about North Korea's weapons programs, and especially the country's missiles, we had the pleasure of interviewing Daniel Pinkston, lecturer in international relations with Troy University in Seoul. Professor Pinkston is also the Northeast Asia Deputy Project Director for the International Crisis Group in Seoul, and before that, was Director of the East Asia Nonproliferation Program at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. Professor Pinkston received his MA in Korean Studies from Yonsei University and his PhD in International Affairs from the University of California, San Diego. He wrote the North Korean Ballistic Missile Program for the Strategic Studies Institute and has published various academic articles and book chapters on security issues on the Korean Peninsula. Professor Daniel Pinkston, welcome to Korea and the World. It's my pleasure to be here. What brought you here to Korea and what made you stay? Well, the first time I came to Korea, I was in the U.S. Air Force and I came here as a Korean linguist. I had been trained at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California. I studied Korean for a year and then did some additional technical training. And I was stationed at Osan Air Base for a year in the 1980s. And then after I got out of the Air Force, I decided to come back to study. And I did that in the 1980s. And I studied at uh, Seoul University Language School and studied more Korean there. And then I went for a master's degree at Yonsei University. So I came back to study after my Air Force time. Every few years, North Korea makes the news worldwide when it performs a test of some new military technology. To start off, why does the North Korean missile program get so much more attention than that of probably any other state? Well, ballistic missiles are dangerous and destabilizing in the sense that once they're launched, you can't recall them as opposed to an aircraft. And they are very fast. There are missile defense systems now, but they're not infallible. So they're difficult to defend against. They are also the preferred delivery means for weapons of mass destruction, particularly nuclear weapons. So when states invest a lot of assets and resources and time into developing ballistic missiles, generally speaking, usually nuclear weapons go along with that because it doesn't make sense to invest so much into a delivery system that would only deliver a conventional warhead. So there were suspicions from quite some time ago, going back to the 1980s, late 1970s, early 1980s, when the indications were observable both on the nuclear side and on the missile side. And North Korea has consistently shown their motivations, their dedications to sustain those programs over time, and their capabilities have gradually been improving and expanding. How far does the history of this missile program reach back, and in what context was it started for North Korea? Well, if you go back to the beginnings of the program, they acquired basic rocket technology going back as far as the 1960s, I would say. They were looking at acquiring nuclear capabilities for peaceful purposes, primarily in the 1950s. And they acquired a Soviet-built small research reactor in the 1960s, around 1964 or so. And they acquired some unguided rockets. They're called free rockets, overground, frog. And uh, those were provided by the Soviet Union and they began to learn uh, rocket technology during that time in the 60s and 70s. They sought technical assistance from China, Soviet Union, and other countries wherever they could get it. So they have this network of procurement activities whereby they're looking for technology, components, materials, and they have sustained that for decades now. So 
There's some controversy or disagreement over the initial Scud missiles, which is a, a short-range missile system. There are some indications that they acquired some Scud missiles and parts, a small number from Egypt in the late 1970s. Others believe they acquired it from the Soviet Union, a number of uh, systems. And others believe that they reached some kind of agreement with the Soviet Union for license productions. Others believe that they, maybe they stole the technology and did it without Soviet permission. But by the mid to, to late 1980s, it was very clear that they had a production capacity and they began to export short-range Scud missiles to Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. And since that time, they've just continually and steadily uh, ramped up their program. Why would such a small country like North Korea start its own missile program when they have two superpowers as allies, China and the Soviet Union? Wouldn't it be easier to just import them from those countries? Well, during the Cold War and in the Cold War context, North Korea was playing Beijing and Moscow off of each other, right? Seeking favor from one side or the other at different times. And to gain favor with Pyongyang, both sides sold them weapons. But they had similar interests. The superpowers had similar interests in preventing arms races and escalation. Even though they were opponents and adversaries during the Cold War, neither the Soviet Union nor the United States nor China wanted to see a war break out on the Korean Peninsula. So they tried to restrain each side while offering some sort of uh, security guarantee. They also wanted to uh, restrain and limit the types of systems that each side had. So they didn't want to sell just any system to North Korea. Of course, there were licensing concerns or what they would do with them. Would they sell them or reverse engineer them and these other uh, issues that uh, go along with it? But nevertheless, North Korea was very determined to acquire these systems on their own. And they didn't want to be dependent upon their superpower allies, the Soviet Union, for these weapon systems. And so they decided to make a decision to acquire the production capability themselves. And that's what they've been trying to do. Are there any purely North Korean missiles that have been created of North Korean design? Well, we do know from their satellite launch in December 2012, the South Koreans were able to uh, raise the first stage off of the ocean floor because it fell in waters near South Korea. And the analysis from that, there was an unclassified version that was published or released. And there's some analysis of the materials and some of the components And some of the components were sourced from abroad, imported. So if you think of it, if you think of a, uh, a product, manufactured product, there are supply chains for most of them. When we talk about an automobile or a uh, computer, or an iPad or something like that, usually all of the parts and components, materials, pieces and everything are not made in one country. So there are economic reasons to save money to source some of the components from different suppliers that might be in another country somewhere. And of course, that's the case with North Korea. So if you think of an automobile, you know, automobile manufacturer, I don't think there is any car where every part or component is made in a single country. And a missile system is much more complex. There are a lot more parts in a missile. So North Korea has gone and sourced some of these things. Now, many of the components and materials are dual use components. They can be used for many different things. So some of the valves or some of the transistors and, and electronic switches and things like that can have many different uses. So instead of setting up a factory themselves and making those parts, which would take a lot of money and time and effort and technology as well, many of those parts they can just buy on the international market. So they will find things however they can get it. They will steal, buy, import, get technology and so forth from many different sources But many of the important parts that are difficult to acquire or that have export controls that countries are not going to sell to you or where it might be illegal for them to sell the products, they focus on manufacturing those pieces themselves. And so they have acquired a lot of um, machine tools and things to make some of the difficult components like the rocket engines and so forth. And those are things that they focus on. In the news, one can read at times about North Korean efforts to trade missile technology with other countries. 
Could you briefly explain what role the export of missile technology from North Korea has played? Yes, they began exporting ballistic missile systems in the 1980s to Iran. When Iran and Iraq were engaged in a war, they began firing missiles at each other, uh, and they called it the War of the Cities. So missile cooperation and sales between North Korea and Iran go back to the 1980s. They've sold to many different countries in the Middle East. But because of the political situation, because of pressure from the U.S. and other countries to um, stop these arms sales because they can be so destabilizing in other areas, the missile sales or exports from North Korea have uh, declined sharply. However, the, there's a strong incentive to do so for North Korea because they can earn hard currency. They can also increase the economies of scale. So if you manufacture a large number of systems, then you can reduce the unit costs. So to get the return on the investment, if they can have a longer production run, it would make economic sense to do that. But there are strong international pressures to stop those kind of sales. So they're nowhere near the number that they used to be back in the 80s or 90s. The past years has also seen the development of a North Korean space program, which has repeatedly been linked to the missile program. Could you explain the connection between the two programs? Well, space launches and the rockets used to place objects into outer space. That's a classic case of a dual-use technology. It can be used for peaceful purposes or military purposes. And it's very difficult to disaggregate and separate the two. So all countries in the world have a legitimate interest in peaceful access to outer space, including North Korea. Satellites can be used for telecommunications, for agriculture, for mapping, for uh, environmental survey, scientific reasons, broadcasting, and so forth. So North Korea has those legitimate interests, and they do have a space program pursuing those activities. However, the launchers can be used to develop ballistic missiles. In the case of space launch vehicles, these have direct applications to developing intercontinental ballistic missiles, long-range missiles that can strike the United States, for example. So there are security implications as well. There would be some ways possibly to demonstrate that your program is absolutely peaceful, but that's difficult to monitor. It would require a number of steps. Also, I think it would mean that if uh, North Korea's program is only peaceful in intent, then there are no reason to have their intermediate range missiles, their Nodong missiles, which can strike Japan, for example, because those can't be used for space launch vehicles. They don't have the thrust and the power to place an object into outer space. So if you really have a peaceful program, then you could dismantle those and get into some kind of regime, the missile technology control regime and some other agreements, international agreements, to limit your capability to the peaceful realm. But of course, North Korea has not demonstrated any intention whatsoever to uh, exercise that type of restraint. Let's talk about the situation today. Compared to other nations, many of which have missile programs and missile stockpiles, is North Korea's program outsized relative to the country's size? Oh, that's a difficult question, difficult to say. I would say that um, putting it in a bigger context, yes, if we look at the military budgets, which are not public, but other data we can look at, the uniform military and the type of weapon systems they have, the number of, of systems that they have, considering the size of their population and their GDP, their portion of military spending compared to GDP or government budget is, I think, uh, hands down the largest in the world. So they allocate a lot of their resources to the military. That's a very strong priority for North Korea. So that's why we see they have chronic food security problems in a number of other areas in terms of consumer goods, quality of life, standard of living, public health, those types of areas are shorted, right? They don't receive the kind of attention and resources that the military programs do. So I would argue that the overwhelming majority of the population pays a very high cost. So these are impressive scientific achievements detonating a nuclear bomb or placing a satellite into orbit, these types of things. They are incredible engineering feats. They're very proud of them, but it comes at a very, very high cost. 
There are negative security externalities. This causes insecurity throughout the region and potentially other regions of the world if they were to sell these technologies or transfer these uh, technologies and systems, which they have done in the past. So this military first or Sungun ideology is an indication of their dedication and seriousness to allocate so much of their productivity and resources to the military. When we hear about missiles, the most famous ones are probably from the United States, such as the cruise missiles that have become a hallmark of US operations. How do the most advanced North Korean missiles compare to this state-of-the-art technology from the US? Well, there are two general types of uh, missile systems. They're quite different. You mentioned cruise missiles, and we had just been talking about ballistic missiles. So cruise missiles are limited in range, and they're slower in terms of their velocity. They're air breathing. They like, uh, have like a jet engine, that type of uh, propulsion system. Whereas a ballistic missile uses a rocket engine and flies on a ballistic path like a, a parabola, right? So it, the engine burns to a certain point, and then it cuts off, and then it just falls in a parabolic path back down to the earth. So you have to aim it at your uh, target in that direction, and then you calculate their computers, flight computers and things, and all the data are put into the computers, and it shuts off at a certain time, and then it falls to its target, where a cruise missile has other types of guidance systems. And it has an engine where it kind of flies like a plane. So they will fly very low usually. So they're harder to detect with radar, but they're limited in range. You can't fly them at intercontinental ranges, of course. So usually they're launched from some other platform, from aircraft or something like that. If you need to strike a target that's far away and you, and you want to be far away enough from the target that it's difficult for your adversary to strike back at you. So with the kind of uh, reach and global reach that the U.S. has, the cruise missiles are, I guess, have greater utility in multiple uh, functions and the type of targets they can hit and so forth. A ballistic missile, you, you need to launch it from a silo or from a launcher. Uh, usually that's from land. There are some short-range systems. There are some guided missiles that South Korean military and U.S. military has here, but they're short range, about 300 kilometers or so. So they're quite different in how they're used and how they're applied in a conflict. But in the case of the United States, cruise missiles, they could carry nuclear warheads as well, but that is not the doctrine so much of the U.S. They're looking to phase those out, and they've only been used for conventional targeting. So uh, North Korea also has a cruise missile program but there's much less known about it. They're working on that. It's more difficult to acquire data or collect data on those systems because they do fly in a stealthy way, close to the ground usually, but they have different applications. But nevertheless, if you are on the targeting end of that, there's a quite a powerful destructive punch that's delivered. How do the most advanced North Korean ballistic missiles compare to the most advanced US missiles? Well, there's really no comparison. The U.S. has a, a long-standing ICBM capability, but that doesn't mean they would be used in a, a tit-for-tat response. North Korea has a reliable short-range ballistic missile called the Scud missile was the, the NATO term for it. The Soviets had another name for it, and the North Koreans call it uh, Hwasong, a uh, Hwasong 5 or 6, which is uh, in the Western jargon, they call it a Scud B or a Scud C, it's the common name for it. Those missiles can travel about 300 kilometers, the Scud C about 500 kilometers. So those are for short ranges. Those can cover the territory in South Korea, for example, if they're launched from the north. North Korea also has a medium range missile, the Nodong, that can fly about 1,000 to maybe 1,300 kilometers, depending upon the size of the warhead. There's a trade-off with a heavier warhead will not fly as far. You reduce the weight of the payload and you can fly farther. So those missiles could strike Japan. And both of those are on mobile launchers, by the way, so that they can drive them around and then erect them. They're liquid-fueled, so they have to fuel them up. It takes some time. But it's very difficult to track them, right? Uh, and then they can uh, launch them or shoot and scoot, as they say, and uh, be on their way. So it's very difficult in a conflict to detect those missiles. Now, North Korea is also working on a longer range missile 
this Hwasong 13 or this KNO 8, it's been dubbed in the West. And supposedly this has, or it's expected to have, intercontinental range. It's also uh, launched from a mobile launcher. And at least in the open source areas, we've only seen these mock-ups that they've driven around. There have been a couple different designs. And those are what they drive around in parades. They're not real missiles. So those could be some kind of uh, notional or the type of system they're trying to design, but we don't know exactly what they're designing. Until there's a flight test, it's really uh, very, very difficult to understand or know what the capabilities are. And if you don't flight test a missile, you really can't be sure of its reliability. It takes a number of tests to certify the, all of the components and the systems and get a firing table and all of those things. So because of the, the limited resources, in North Korea, the resource constraints and the political pressure, they don't have the luxury of conducting a large number of flight tests, say like the US and the Soviet Union did during the Cold War. So those are necessary steps to acquire the kind of capabilities of an advanced missile power and and North Korea is nowhere near that yet. But nevertheless, I mean, they can cause a lot of damage if these systems were used in a conflict. Basic as this question may be, What type of targets are missiles supposed to hit nowadays? Generally speaking, according to the Geneva Conventions, International Humanitarian Law and Laws of War and that, military weapons should not target civilian populations. They should not target non-combatants. Now, of course, there are non-combatant casualties. There is collateral damage in a uh, conflict. However, military commanders are supposed to make efforts to minimize that collateral damage. But when you're talking about ballistic missile systems, particularly if they are uh, wedded with uh, WMD, with a nuclear warhead or with the chemical payload, for example, those weapons cause widespread destruction, mass destruction. So if they were to target a city, it could have a devastating effect. They kill indiscriminately. And in fact, the North Korean missiles, these Scud missiles, the short-range missiles, do not have the accuracy to be effective in a military conflict. And what I mean is, if you're in a military conflict and you are launching your weapons to degrade or destroy the adversary, so in that case, it would be something like um, airfields. If there were conflict on the peninsula, North Korea, they would, the military objectives would be things like to destroy the airfields where the aircraft would take off, the South Korean and the U.S. aircraft would take off, destroy fuel depots and um, storage centers, ammunition depots, those types of things. But with a conventional warhead, a Scud missile, uh, the accuracy is is, uh, not sufficient to, you know, with a high, highly reliable pinpoint accuracy able to knock out an airfield, for example. And the the farther away it is, there's drift and uh, inaccuracy um, comes into the flight path. So it's just as uh, likely that uh, if they tried to destroy Osan Air Base, let's say, the airfield at Osan Air Base, it's just as likely that the missile would fall on the town next to the air base as opposed to destroying the airfield. So they would have to, to launch a number of missiles to be sure that it would uh, actually destroy the airfield. Or you could use a nuclear weapon, right? Then you're off by one or two kilometers, it's, it's good enough. So that's another reason why when we see this kind of missile proliferation and states building these types of systems, it doesn't make much sense in terms of military utility unless they deliver nuclear payloads. But then we get into another realm where there are or a number of casualties of non-combatants. And I think the, the legal scholars will say that it um, would be a violation of international humanitarian law and so forth. And just morally speaking, I mean, uh, the types of mass casualties that it would cause is uh, you know, against international norms. How many missiles does North Korea have and how many of them are considered to be ready to use? Well, the, the general numbers, I don't recall exactly off the top of my head, but it's about a thousand, maybe eight. 100, 900, 1,000, a mixture of Scud, Bs, and Cs, and Nodong missiles. 
there's some discussion or lack of consensus, I would say, on some of the other intermediate range missiles. There's the so-called Musadan missile that is estimated to be able to fly or to have a range of about 4,000 kilometers, but it's never been flight tested, so I don't think it's reliable, or even if it is a, a viable system, we don't know. Of course, they couldn't use it in a conflict yet. But even though they have that large number of missiles, several, several hundred missiles stored in mostly in, um, in underground facilities, they're limited by the number of launchers, the TELs, the transporter erector launchers. Those, the numbers are under 100 of launchers for SCUDs and Nodongs. So even though it, you might have 500 missiles, but if you only have 50 launchers, it's not like you can launch 500 missiles at once, right? So you might uh, be able to launch a missile off it with that launcher, and then you'd have to go back and get another missile and then get your uh, fuel and oxidizer and go back and fuel up that, that missile. So they're limited or constrained by that number. That's a very important number. A lot of people just focus on the number of missiles and they assume or they think that that also includes the launcher, but that is not the case. And do we have an estimate of how many launchers exist? I've seen some numbers. It's fewer than 100, under 100. So what technologies is North Korea trying to test and to develop nowadays? What is the next step for them? Well, they're, they're looking to develop a bigger space launch vehicle, which would have direct applications to the development and deployment of an ICBM that could strike the United States and hold the U.S. Uh, hostage to a retaliatory strike in the case of any conflict on the Korean Peninsula. So that's what North Korea is trying to acquire. So in order to do that, they need to test a number of different systems and subsystems. So the bigger the rocket, the more powerful it is, the higher thrust that you have and all of that, the temperatures and pressures increase tremendously. And so the engineering problems become very, very difficult. So how you can make the, the rocket engine and uh, make a, a material or a metal that does not melt or does not blow apart the pieces and the turbo pumps and things like that that are pumping the fuel. And then also as, it, as the payload re-enters the atmosphere, you need a re-entry vehicle because of the, the vibration and the temperature burn up unless you have the technology and the materials that will enable the, the payload to re-enter intact and then have the uh, bomb or the nuclear payload explode and work. So those are a number of very, very difficult engineering steps in uh, these extreme temperatures and pressures and vibration. So you can only do that through testing. You need to test. Even if you're the greatest scientist in the world, uh, you actually have to do it to see how it works. The engineers have to go through those steps and see how they can make a reliable system. As is well known, the international community has been trying to stop, to shut down North Korea's nuclear program for two decades. Have similar efforts been made with regards to the missile program? Yes, there were efforts in the 1990s in particular. When the U.S. was engaged with North Korea under a bilateral framework called the Agreed Framework that froze the nuclear program, and had an end objective of reversing and rolling back the nuclear program. The U.S. began talks on uh, ballistic missiles. They held a number of rounds of ballistic missile talks to constrain the program. Israel, interestingly enough, also approached the problem before the U.S. did in the late 90s. They wanted to somehow persuade North Korea to stop its missile exports to the Middle East because that was threatening from Israel's perspective. However, the U.S. dissuaded Israel from doing that. They said, uh, don't do that. We'll talk to them. We'll take over these talks. We'll begin talks with them. There was some limited initial progress. North Korea did announce a couple times that they would put a moratorium on flight testing, but then uh, that didn't last for long, and those talks uh, eventually broke down. So I don't see any similar format or negotiations getting restarted now. North Korea has demonstrated several times that it does have nuclear capability. Is it able to deliver any of these via missiles as of today? That's difficult to say. No one knows that. 
outside of a very small circle of North Koreans. And uh, they are working to acquire that capability. I'm quite confident of that. They're working on that every day. I don't think they ever take a day off. But it's quite complicated and it's not so simple. Even if you have a capability, you have surmounted all of the technical and scientific barriers. So you actually have a weapon. But then when you start thinking of the human organizations, the institutional framework that you need to safeguard them, warehouse them, conduct all of the safety and reliability checks, all of the command and control issues, knowing when, how, and where you would use them and under what conditions, developing a doctrine, and then knowing institutionally that all of those processes would work during a crisis, it's not so simple at all. And in fact, it creates a number of potential problems for security and actually making North Korea insecure. So they are going to have to grapple with all of these issues So if someone has control of the nuclear arsenal, what kind of locks or safety systems, arming systems they might have, who has control of it, who has the physical control, what is the the chain of authority and how that would be transferred and actually used to a military commander or the commander of the strategic rocket forces in North Korea. Those are not trivial issues or simple issues. They're also working on a submarine launch ballistic missile and uh, they've conducted some tests of that. Now, if they acquire that capability, and they're probably years off from that, but in a few years down the road, if they do have that system and you have a nuclear-armed missile on a submarine out there, the communication problems in those systems are not trivial either. And how they would control that could absolutely be imperfect, and there could be problems with uh, unauthorized or accidental launches accidents. So these are not trivial issues. Even if even if North Korea did not use these systems in anger deliberately, there's also possibly, even though it's low, but it, nevertheless it exists. And I would say it's higher in North Korea than it was in the U.S. or the Soviet Union during the Cold War. But we had a lot of close calls during the Cold War. Accidents and fires, plane crashes, Some nuclear bombs were dropped accidentally from U.S. aircraft, and fortunately they did not explode or detonate. There were some bombs, hydrogen bombs, that were engulfed in uh, massive uh, fires for aircraft accidents and where the uh, conventional explosives uh, melted and so forth. So we were very lucky that we didn't have this kind of accident. There could be an accident from misperception. If they thought there was uh, an attack and there really wasn't, and they felt that they had to respond. So there are a number of these problems, potential problems with command and control that will come into this calculation as well or creates the um, you know, greater insecurity or, or potential problems in the future. A few years ago, a report by the RAND Corporation concluded that, and I quote, the main purpose of the program seems to be political, to create the impression of a serious missile threat. Do you agree with this assessment? Well, North Korea uses its programs to achieve its goals, the political leadership's goals. They act very rationally in this way. So what are they trying to achieve in terms of political orientation and national security orientation and foreign policy in that, an international relations perspective? They are very hardcore realists. I say that in the sense of political science term. They are obsessed with uh, power. They believe the international system is a hostile, anarchic environment. It's a self-help system. The only way they can ensure their security is through acquiring their own military capabilities. It's all about power. It's not everything. It's the only thing for North Korea. So whatever anyone else has, they want to have this capability. So from a national security standpoint, it's desirable from North Korean perspective. Secondly, also for prestige, domestically and internationally. They believe that there's a, a certain status and prestige that goes along with these weapons. So there's an expectation that they will acquire that prestige as well. There's a third thing they want, and this is what most people in the West, well, anywhere outside of North Korea, North, South, East, or West, misses this one. And that is that nuclear weapons are viewed as a necessary condition for economic development. 
Now, most people look at North Korea and they say, well, this comes at a huge cost. You're under sanctions. There's a huge opportunity cost because of this. So it impedes your economic development. That's not how North Korea thinks. That's not what their ideology teaches. In fact, teaches that that's a necessary condition. And if they were to abandon their nuclear and missile programs, then they would also be abandoning hope of economic development. So that's how they, they think. That's how they view it. If the state is a nuclear state, which they identify with and that's what they call themselves now, then that is a more capable state, a more powerful and capable state is viewed as um, one that can pursue other goals and is more capable and has greater capacity to pursue economic development or whatever goal it has. So they believe that's a necessary condition, not an obstacle to economic development. So that's what they're looking at as well. A heated debate in South Korea revolves around the THAAD technology. Could you briefly explain what the fuss is all about and whether or not it would actually be effective against North Korea? THAAD stands for Terminal High Altitude Air Defense, I think. It's a missile defense system that intercepts ballistic missiles in the terminal phase. So it would only have the capability to, to intercept missiles that were targeted at South Korea. And there is a lot of disagreement and the politicization of this issue, which is interesting to me because it's a very complex technical system. So in terms of a technical national security issue, this is a clear example of that for me. And it shouldn't be political at all, but it has all of these political repercussions now, both domestically in South Korea, certainly it's an issue with North Korea, and then China as well and to a lesser extent, uh, Russia. The problem, politically speaking, and at least symbolically, for the Chinese, they believe that, in particular, the radar, the tracking radar that would be deployed with that system could pick up launches from Chinese territory and any kind of objects that are, are launched, not necessarily from North Korea at South Korea. And they believe that that tracking data could be fed into a regional missile defense system or into the U.S. system that would give the U.S. and its allies data on Chinese launches as well, and somehow this would undermine their deterrent. I think it's exaggerated, but maybe a lot of the Chinese strategists are thinking that this is the first step of an integrated, allied missile defense system that could be expanded. This would be a first piece and that there would be a continual development and expansion of, of those capabilities that would undermine China's ability to retaliate with its ballistic missile force. So they've been trying to, um, there've been a lot of political statements directed at Seoul that uh, there would be cost to pay and that China would be um, somehow take this as a threat. So we'll see how that's going to play out. But having greater capabilities to defend against a missile attack seems to be in the Republic of Korea's interest because if not, then they're held hostage to um, North Korea's missile threat. As someone who is living and working in South Korea, do you think that one should be afraid of North Korea's uh, missile program? I don't know if afraid is the, the word, certainly concerned. The good news from my perspective is that I believe North Korea can be deterred. So with uh, adequate assets in place, with the adequate reassurance to allies in the region, adequate resources deployed, military resources, that could deliver an unacceptable uh, retaliatory punishment or strike against North Korea, then they are unlikely, they're not going to use those systems. They're not going to launch an unprovoked missile strike against the South. It would be suicidal. In fact, that would bring on the very thing that, that North Korea is trying to prevent. But that said, there's always a possibility of misperception, some miscalculation, some inadvertent escalation that begins from some other problem. And suddenly we go up very quickly up the escalatory ladder and where North Korea would feel that they're boxed in, they feel they have to use their missile capabilities and launch them before they're destroyed, for example. So that kind of accident or inadvertent escalation is what I'm always concerned about, but this requires a lot of um, you know, national security research, policy implementation, training, 
acquisition of weapon systems and surveillance systems and everything else. And that's what South Korea is doing every day. Can never be perfect at it, but the U.S. does that along with its South Korean allies. And uh, hopefully those very terrible outcomes will be avoided. Professor Pinkston, thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.